Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode 8 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined once again by my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And, uh, wow, hearing you say episode 8, uh, it's been uh, 8 it's been, episodes already. It's been 8 months. 8 months, at least. 4 short of 12, <laughs> which would be uh, 3 short of 15, <laughs> and 5 short of 20. So that's... Uh, you, you lost me when you said, uh, uh, you know, four short of 12. I was told there would no be, be no math. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, I, I'd love to take this uh, opportunity to sort of thank our listeners. Uh, we've received uh, a lot of feedback, uh, verbal or otherwise, meaning people emailing us. And so... Really a, a, a lot of very positive, uh, yeah. some uh, very hurtful, i got to be honest. <laughs> I, I didn't appreciate the, the tea painting of my house. I thought that was uh, unnecessary. But, but maybe that's just me. Uh, but but yeah, we're you know we're, we're we're glad to know that you're out there listening, and we're certainly doing our very best to make the show as interesting and engaging and diverse as possible. And I think that's certainly reflected in just uh, the people we have had on over the past eight months, and uh, the people we're planning to have on in the next eight months and the next eighteen months, and and uh, however long as we go forward. So we, we've got some some very cool stuff coming up that that I think that you will. Enjoy. That's right, and and I also want to say, you know, we haven't been uh, as particular as we've wanted to be in terms of always, hit, you know, having our show post the first Friday of every month, and, and that's not by virtue of laziness. Um, well, maybe for Zucky. No, yeah, no I'm joking. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's just by virtue of the fact that you know we have guests who have very busy schedules, and uh, you know, and, and that and that and that and, and that can sometimes come in the way. So. Just want to make that also throw that out there. But but we're making every yeah. effort. So so definitely be aware. Uh, our goal is to be up like clockwork the first Friday of every month, and and uh, we'll we'll inshallah we'll do everything we can to make that happen. Inshallah. Uh, now I did want to briefly mention a review that we got on iTunes, and and this is by the way something if if you leave us feedback, you can either write a review on iTunes, write us a review on Stitcher Radio, or send us an email diffusedcongruence at gmail dot com. Either way, whatever you send us, we will read it and do our best to respond to it on uh, on our air. So I wanted to read this review. This is by the Roderick on iTunes, and uh, he says or she says. Great in-depth interviews with various personalities across the spectrum of American Islam. I'd like to hear more about the hosts. I'd like to hear Pervez interview Zucky and vice versa. The hosts themselves would make great guests. And I just want to say, this is me, uh, I totally agree. (laughs) I I, I too think we would make great guests. So in in that month where we find no guests, we will be doing that, not because we're desperate, but because you asked for it. So we have an excuse. Uh, Be careful what you wish for. That's right. Uh, The guest list has been great, but I'd love to hear from folks in government or the establishment of immigrant Muslim institutions. Perhaps more on the arts. A focus on music and literature would be great. I'm sure it's a challenge to coordinate with such busy people, but I look forward to how this great effort develops. Well, first of all, thank you for calling it a great effort. We're we're certainly making uh, uh, an effort to make it a great effort. So uh, we appreciate the feedback, and uh, you did hit on it, obviously, getting people... Uh, to, to nail down time in their very hectic schedules for little old us can be a challenge, but that's but, right. Uh, and, and one of the part, you know, part of the calculus, you know, month in month out for us, at least it, it, it is always, you know, how can we make the show as diverse as possible? How can we get a different voice, you know, uh, talk about an area that we haven't talked about, you know, before. So we, we try to do that. And so certainly, you know, when you say, you know, people in government or in the arts, that's definitely part of that. That is something on our mind. And we, we have actually talked about the uh, bannered about some names in terms of people we can get who would be would, 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 would fit within that sort of role. And I think that's a good way to segue into our guest for uh, this month's episode, who we're very excited to have on. And that's Professor Zarina Graywall from uh, Yale University, who we'll be talking to about her new book. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, now, by, by way of background, Professor Graywall is a historical anthropologist and a documentary filmmaker whose research focuses on race, gender, religion, nationalism, and transnationalism across a wide spectrum of American Muslim communities. Um, 
her first film by the dawn's early light, Chris Jackson's Journey to Islam, examines the radicalization of Islam and the scrutiny of American Muslims' patriotism long before September 11, 2001. She was a Fulbright Fellow in Egypt in 2002 and 2003, and she received the Fulbright's prestigious Islamic Civilization Grant. Uh, she has written a new book, which is Islam is a Foreign Country, which looks at American Muslims and the global crisis of authority. So a lot of heady stuff covered in a way that's accessible to a mainstream audience. Now, we definitely want to get into the book. We were, we were expecting to have a, a lengthy conversation about that, but we also want to get into your background and kind of the story uh, that you have that sort of brings you to this point. So uh, why don't we get started with that? Uh, Pervis? Yeah, Cesarina, I mean, I, and, you know, I, I know that uh, our, our paths crossed uh, shortly in Michigan. Um, and uh, just by way of, I think, just for our listening audience as well, and I mentioned this to you too as well, Zarina, um, uh our very name, Diffuse Congruence, is actually something that uh, uh, someone who is near and dear to both of us, Serena, Professor Sherman Jackson, actually is one of sort of his, uh, his ideas. And uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd love for you to talk sort of about your experiences, uh, you growing up, uh, your background, kind of where you're from, your family, et cetera. Sure. Um, so my my family, I was um, born in Akron, Ohio, raised in um, greater Detroit, Michigan, and um, <clears throat> since then have lived in uh, Chicago and uh, different parts of the Middle East, um, New York, and now I live in New Haven, Connecticut. And so, um, uh, you know, I kind of see myself as part of <laughs> what you might call sort of the, 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 the Midwestern um, mosque Muslim community, uh, you know, which is, I think, um, something that makes Michigan an interesting place, um, for when we talk about Islam in America, it's, it's both like exceptional, it's different from other places, but it's also representative of a lot of kind of, I think, um, uh, you know, national patterns and things. And so I feel like uh, that's actually the, where I begin the book is that, you know, Michigan, especially Dearborn, Michigan, sort of becomes in many ways like the poster child of, uh, of Islam in America or sort of like the, you know, the, the, the favorite uh, entry point. And that's, of course, home for me. Um, and when I, we first came to Detroit, um, my family lived in, Ham- in Hamtramck, which at the time, uh, which is like a, essentially a, a sort of small uh, enclave within Detroit, wow. uh, Polish enclave. But at the time, it was also a Punjabi. It was becoming a Punjabi and black neighborhood um, after white flight. Uh, and, and so that was sort of my first kind of... Um, those are my first memories. And then, you know, like many immigrants, um, we did leave the, leave Detroit ultimately and move to the suburbs. Um, but that really colored my experience because, um, <clears throat> Really, uh, my family, because of the, because I came from a sort of very working class Punjabi, um, community, even when we moved into the white suburbs, we we're still very connected to those, uh, communities in Detroit and other places, but also we were part of the kind of suburban, more upwardly mobile, predominantly South Asian communities in, um, what's now Canton, Michigan and, um, Troy, Michigan. And so, you know, um, I sort of feel like, uh, the picture of what Islam in Detroit looks like is often uh you know dearborn and then the south asian communities in other words those sort of become like the 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 default picture of what um islam in michigan looks like and i know those places and those are places are home but there's also i think a whole other sort of subculture of of muslims and mosque muslims in detroit that's lost uh in, in that and that was something that was actually very very familiar to me i mean on my own street we had albanian muslims we had you know i my family went to many different kinds of mosque communities and um and so yeah i feel like uh for me you know part of my career choices has been trying to figure out how to make the story of just sort of my own upbringing um and the kind of richness of that, uh, you know, part of the picture of what Islam in America looks like. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I think, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Detroit as being somewhat typical as well as atypical in terms of uh, the, the, the sort of prototypical or picture of Islam in America. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's also interesting within that context to note the history of Islam in the black American community and the black mm-hmm. American experience and how Michigan at large and perhaps Detroit in particular, you know, plays in that as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think I think uh, so often now um, the conversation um, is overly uh, determined by these kinds of you know divisions between immigrants and Black Muslims and um, other other kinds of. Um, you know, class or whatever, whatever the different divisions are that people think about Sunni and Shia, right? Um, but to be honest, for me, growing up, you know, it really was uh, the if I could have if there's one word that I would use to, to describe Muslim communities in Detroit, the ones that I grew up in, uh, it would be fluid. I mean, they were incredibly fluid mm. communities, and so uh, for me, you know, I mean, African American Muslims were always part of my community, whatever community I was in. Uh, and, 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 you know, it is true that, and I've done research on this, which is that, you know, there, there are, um, you know, really, uh, profound fractures between these communities and tensions between communities along issues of race and class and other things. Uh, that's not to, to, um, I mean, I guess I'm not trying to present like a utopic picture, but, right. but, but at the same time, I think that in some ways it's, it's the, the, the privileging of the kind of, of a kind of like upper class Middle Eastern and South Asian immigrant perspective or story, you kind of lose the fact that in, when you start looking at like working class communities, including immigrant communities, there's actually a lot more fluidity. So, I mean, for example, you know, my uncles all dated black women. They lived in Detroit. I have a cousin who's half black, um, you know, uh, many men who married non-South Asian women married Latina and black women. Those were the aunties in my immediate circle. Um, and and so that's, 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 that might be, you know, I, and so this, it's not that these people were, um, sort of out of, out of my view. I mean, they were actually kind of part and parcel of this, what I'm kind of, what I think of as a sort of Punjabi working class community. And, and so it wasn't that it was like, any kind of racial utopia for by any by any means, but it, it was much more racially mixed and much more racially complicated. Um, and I mean, for example, you know, something that just like a kind of truism that I grew up with is that desis are desis, like you know, they say in Punjabi that desis always will be desis. What does that mean? It's sort of a self-deprecating um, expression that means that you know, we'll never change. So Desi actually means local, right? And so what's interesting for me when I think back on it is that that's an expression that would be used to describe why the mosque parking lot was chaos, why uh, everybody's always late. Uh, but it was something that could easily be extended. Sometimes it meant, sometimes Desi's meant Punjabi, sometimes it meant South Asian, sometimes it meant blacks, you know? So you you know what I mean? Like uh, it could mean, it, it, was a, it was a term that was very fluid. And I think, um, you know, that's something that we sometimes lose that sort of um, richness and complexity and fluidity in the way people imagine who they belong to and who they, who, who, who's us, uh, right. I think is actually much more, much more fluid sometimes than we, we realize, especially when, you know, people are, I, I mean, every, pretty much all of the uncles that I grew up with, they all worked on the line at one or at one of the big three auto companies. Right. And that meant that they all worked with, black men and you know so, they, so these were not people that we didn't see in our homes or you know I mean, and, and then many of them were not muslim so right. it was just it, that, but that was that was that was who we were right and i think i mean i think what you're presenting this 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 uh, the, the community that's often forgotten also kind of flies in the face of people who sort of look at it in terms of bifurcated lines along you know if, if immigrant versus indigenous quote unquote indigenous american muslims right yeah, I don't uh, like that term, but yeah, it's a well, long-standing yeah, fight between me and Dr. Jackson. No, but. Certainly, <laughs> I, I really love that part, and, and it, we'll we'll unpack a lot of the stuff that you talk about in your book. But yeah, um, yeah I, I think I think just your own experiences, uh, you know, sort of illustrate that. Just growing up in the kind of community you grew up in. Yeah, and I, and I also have to say, even within the immigrant experience, I mean, so much. That's first of all, my, my father came before '65. He was here mm-hmm. uh, as a student, um, as an orphan, and he did not come, you know, um, as a post '65 immigrant. The post '65 immigrants were much more upwardly mobile. Um, my father did not complete his degree. He dropped out uh, very soon after starting college in the U.S. and became a hippie and was part of the counterculture at the time and part of the civil rights movement. And so, you know, he, he had a very different kind of, I think, experience of the U.S. But frankly, you know, he we, we, he never 
ever intended for us to settle in the U.S. I grew up in a home where we constantly were, you know, the U.S. was, was not about the, the American dream for my father at all. This was a pit stop. We were, you know, we were here for now. And so we would try to sell the house. We would never buy too many toys, never change appliances, don't change the car because we were about to leave. And we tried to move back to Pakistan several times. Mm. So for me, you know, um, I think even just even just the story of the South Asian immigrant is just so overdetermined by a particular upwardly mobile South Asian post-65 immigrant story about the American dream, about trying to settle in the U.S. It's really my mother who, you know, kind of eventually, she was the one who kind of pushed my family into socializing with those more wealthy communities in Canton and in Troy and other places. And, and, um, and so through them, you know, we were more exposed to the idea of, oh, no, this is the destination point. The U.S. is the destination point. The American dream is the goal. And, and so really for me, my whole life, I feel like, was a kind of a battle between these two very different uh, visions of what America was. Was it a pit stop? Was it home? Or was it just, uh, you know, or, or, or what, you know, was the American dream real or was it or not? And, and so um, that really profound ambivalence, I think, is something that, you know, is, is, is much more typical of working class immigrants for whom life in America is actually very difficult and, and, they're, and, they're, and it's not stable. Um, and and so that was how we grew up. I mean, I, I, I think I, I don't think it was until I was maybe in high school that we finally kind of agreed that, OK, maybe we would actually end up staying here. My parents have now been in the U.S., I think, for 40 years. So, yeah. so they're, they're here now. But, you know, it took a long time before um, I think my father kind of accepted that we had actually settled here. So how does how does growing up with that idea in the back of your mind that, well, this is, you know, we're, we're not, we don't want to build on a bridge here because we're headed to, I mean, how does that affect your growing up and your socialization? Like what, what what's that yeah. thing? I think Dr. Jackson's called it this, but like other people perhaps as well, sort of the myth of return, right? Kind of living with that mythology always in the background. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I mean, although my parents were, relatively religious and Islam was always a big part of our home life. Um, at the same time, because my father came to the U S so young and he was so, uh, I guess, culturally assimilated. I mean, he doesn't have an accent. He, he came, he came at 18. And, um, and, and like I said, he was, you know, I mean, let me put it this way. I, uh, when I walked into my, you know, very traditional Desi wedding. Jimmy, he had like Third Rock from the Sun by Jimi Hendrix was playing. That was the CD that he picked. I mean, you know what I mean? He's very like assimilated into this culture. And so, you know, this was definitely a bridge for him or, you know, not a, not home. America was not home, but he didn't have a kind of, um, he wasn't distant from the from the kind of the cultural mainstream at the same time. So so and and and, I, and either were any of these other Punjabi uncles that I knew because as I said, many of them were married to Latina and Black women. So it wasn't like they were living in a desi bubble. Even when we lived in Hamtramck, which was a Punjabi neighborhood, and and uh, you know like there was a lot of Punjabis, but you still you you couldn't really completely di- divorce yourself from the culture around you. Uh, and because they all came relatively young. They were they were they were culturally American in many many ways, um, but you know that that kind of so I, I had a certainly had a bicultural um, I don't know upbringing you know um, but but uh, but the the what it what it does is it does instill a very profound sense of ambivalence towards America as as do we really belong here? But frankly, that wasn't just because of my father. That was also because of you know. The Satanic Verses novel or like, you know, the Iranian hostage crisis or a million, million other things that I was also hearing that were telling me that this isn't really where we belong. Yeah, no. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. And I, and I don't want to I mean, we don't need to sort of uh, go into detail, but I think being that your background is Punjabi. And if we look at sort of the Punjabi community back in the continent, um, very kind of a lot of the themes that you're talking about they kind of live it too because, you know, Punjabis are unique in a sense in terms of quote unquote Desi communities or communities in the subcontinent wherein, you know, you have a, a standing or a substantial Punjabi culture and, and community in India and at the same time in Pakistan and how mm-hmm. the partition and all those events sort of play out in that community in particular. More, right. More so than the Hyderabadis or the, you know, uh, you know, UP people or whatever, right? So exactly, that, um, exactly. And, and, I should, and I should say that, you know, I mean, uh, Hamtramck, when I lived there, yeah. was, a, was a Punjabi enclave. Now Hamtramck is a Muslim enclave, meaning there's like Bengalis 
an African-American Muslim. That's but, but, but when I was growing up, it was not a Muslim neighborhood. It was a Punjabi neighborhood, meaning there was as many Sikhs as there were Muslims. Wow. And they were just as much as part of our social circle as the Muslim Muslim Punjabis. So so that's really interesting. I mean, I think that, um, you know, when we tell the story of like Islam in Detroit, we you know, sometimes we over we, we forget that there there was all these other kinds of lines that were being crossed that were cultural, you know, like uh, essentially there was all these there's all these cultural alliances that we kind of skim over if we just look if we just focus on only muslim communities uh because you know even in my as i said in my neighborhood yeah we had albanian muslims we had so many i mean I, frankly as a kid i thought arabs because when we moved to the suburbs the the arabs that lived in the white suburb that my parents moved to um which were very few and far between they were all chaldean meaning they were catholic and as a kid i thought that south asians were muslims and arabs were catholic it took me a long time to figure out wait the prophet was arab and people in dearborn are also arab like i didn't really quite make the connection because so many of the arabs that i knew as a kid Actually, all of them in my neighborhood, once we moved to the suburbs, were, were Catholic. And, and it were, it, Detroit has a huge Arab Christian population. So this, you know, that's what I'm saying is that these categories of like Arab equals Muslim or, you know, uh, or, you know, D- D- Dearborn is Muslim or what, you know, I mean, there's, in fact, these things are far more complicated. And when, you, when I think about it from a kid's perspective, it's just, I don't know, just, it just, to me, it just like reveals like how, how poor we are as, adults trying to represent the world to ourselves um in fact kids often pick up on on the sort of nuances and complexities in a way that we you know we lose as we get older i think sometimes yeah so at at what point do you start making more of an effort to sort of engage with with some of the intellectual ideas that obviously you're you're bringing to to fruition now via your 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 uh teaching and and your your book Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was somebody who was definitely not tracked for this. I, you know, um, as I said, the, because I grew up in a mostly working class Muslim community, um, that was sort of our, our inner circle that we did. We did were part of these more upwardly mobile South Asian Muslim communities. Uh, college was not an obvious choice for me. I came very close to not going to college at all. Uh, you know, frankly, it was just not seen as a big deal. It wasn't seen as particularly important. Um, my father never finished his degree. And it just, you know, at the time he had had a, one of the ways in which our sort of, um, gateways to getting back to Pakistan was to have an import export business. And so, uh, which is sort of a kind of typical, I don't know, immigrant, you know, thing. Um, right. And so like, you know, we'd have the suitcases full of samples and all these other things. Pakistan. And and so at the time he had had a business that had failed. And so it, we had basically lost all of our family savings. Um, and so my father just sort of, uh, you know, mentioned kind of in passing, he's like, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for you to go to college. Uh, it'd be better if you just got a full-time job. At the time I was working in a really hip record store as a cashier. And I thought it was like the best job in the world. So I, I was totally open to not going to college and just continuing to work at the record store uh, and getting, you know, backstage passes and doing all these things. Awesome. I, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly interested in going to college, even though I had, had um, you know, I had many friends that were going to go to college. So it wasn't, it wasn't a disappointment at all for me, but it was really my mother who, you know, there's very, she, my parents have a very kind of traditional, I came from, came from a very kind of traditional patriarchal kind of Punjabi background. And so from my, there's very few times that I can think of that my mother kind of went against my father's will, but that was one. And, and that was what she basically said was that there's no way my daughter who's living in the land of, you know, opportunity, as she calls America all the time, um, is, gonna, is not going to go to college because I went to college and, you know, in, 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 I, I'm from Mandi Bahadur, which is a small town in, in small rural town in Punjab. And I went to college in Punjab. So how could she live in America and not go to college? She has to go to college. And so then that was her total insistence uh, that I that I that I go. And the, ultimately, the compromise was that I would I would keep the um, full time job at the record store and go to college, which was at a small commuter college in Dearborn. And, uh, and so, you know, there it, I, I, because I had been a good student, I was put in an honor. I was sort of tracked into this honors program and I had a couple of professors that really were basically encouraging me to leave the commuter, co- the commuter college, um, Deer- University of Michigan, Dearborn. Okay. Uh, and they just said, you know, you really shouldn't be here. This is not, you know, you should, you should transfer to Ann Arbor. And when I went to Ann Arbor, um, I, which I went in my junior year, I transferred to Ann Arbor. Really, I mean, they just 
it was out of pure pressure. Fr- frankly, I for me, Ann Arbor was not an option because it required you to li- li- like live off campus, which like good Punjabi girls did not leave their parents' homes. You know, that was just sort of like unthinkable. Um, and so. Uh, I finally sort of, you know, these professors were sort of insisting and they were taught, you would even talk to my parents about it. And, and so then my, my mom and dad kind of begrudgingly agreed that, okay, maybe I should, maybe I could live, you know, 40 minutes away in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that might, wow. might be able to stomach that. And so when I went to Ann Arbor, I encountered two, um, you know, it's a huge school. I could have very easily gotten lost, but it just, it just happened that um, the Nassib were, you know, the I guess what was that I would have these two mentors that I met right away. Uh, Sherman Jackson was one of them. And the other one was a woman by the name of Ruth Behar, who's a Cuban anthropologist. And they both were themselves first generation college students. And they just kind of took me under their wing and, Really, I mean, it was that was that first semester in Ann Arbor. They both just sort of, I don't know, zoomed in on me and kind of started mentoring me from the very beginning and started pushing me to consider graduate school. So, uh, so this was, you know, I, I was the kind of person that had like a different major every semester. I thought I was going to be a math major. I did. I, mean, I had many different, you know, I, I so I was not at all like focused or ambitious, frankly. Um, but these people seem to. I don't know, have a, have a vision for me that, that I was open to at least. Uh, and so they really were, were pushing me to start thinking about, um, so Ruth Bahar was in anthropology and Sherman right. Jackson uh, is in Islamic studies, but he, he had started focusing on Islam in the U S um, at this time. And this was what he was really writing um, the book, which is now Islam and the black American. Got it. And so he wanted me, and he was having, he was coming up against a lot of resistance within Islamic studies and Middle East studies um, for working outside of the region of the Middle East. And so he really was discouraging me from even considering Islamic studies. So he he, he actually wanted me to do American studies, not anthropology. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was kind of torn between the two. And eventually I did, you know, once I graduated, I did, I did take a year off. I taught first grade for a year. And then uh, I came back and I, you know, applied to grad schools. And, and I started off in American studies uh, following Sherman Jackson's advice at Michigan. And then I, did, I didn't quite, quite like it. The department was in a lot of transition at the time. So then I switched over to back to anthropology and history. Um, but I continued to work with both both Ruth uh, Behar and Sherman Jackson as my uh, co-advisors throughout graduate school. And so really that was the kind of pivotal point is when I came came there as a junior, I probably would not have become an academic uh, if I hadn't met them my junior year. So then is it as a graduate student that you begin to sort of think about the kinds of ideas that you explore in Islam as a foreign country? Um, even as an undergraduate, I did a senior thesis project actually on the um, greater Muslim communities, uh, uh, the greater the, the, the greater Detroit Muslim communities, and looking at patterns of, of marriage patterns and um, interracial marriage in particular, and uh, also um, intra. Uh, racism, in other words, ra- you know, kind of shadism or colorism or whatever you want to call it, the kind of... Um, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that, you know, that, that, this idea of, like, lighter being more attractive in whether it's Arab or South Asian or African American communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was, that was, so I had, I had, so, so even as an undergraduate, I had, in fact, that actually became the first journal article that I ever published was out from that senior thesis. So I, for even as an undergraduate, you know, they had, they had sort of mentored me and gotten me to the point where I could do independent research. And that's why they really pushed me. They said, you know, if you can do independent research like this, and it was like a massive study, I don't know how many, a hundred plus interviews that I did. And I mean, it was just such a huge, you know, I had a lot of energy. I was 20, 22 or 21. So I now look back on it and think, God, I don't even know how I did that in like a summer, but, um, you know, it was just, it was just a, it was just a massive undertaking. And, and that for them was just like, you have to go to graduate school because you're doing this really, uh, sophisticated research as a senior. So you absolutely have to try it, you know, just and see what happens. And so like those, but, but for me, the, all those questions came from very personal places. So I, I feel like, um, for me, college was an introduction to kind of how to frame questions around race and, um, you know, uh, Muslims in the U S that I had kind of been obsessed with my whole life. And, and, and so it just kind of became a way to enter a conversation. They were tools. They were giving me tools basically, or teaching me a new language um, to talk about something that, that, that was very familiar to me. So um, let's, let's kind of segue into the, the book a little bit here. 
Okay. Uh, this is this is a a pretty wide ranging topic, and I mean, I think I think just to start things off, uh, maybe you can explain the the title to us. Islam is a foreign country. <laughs> yeah, not everybody likes the title. I have to confess. Um, yeah, so it's not a prescriptive title. It's you know it it it's actually exactly trying to get at this um, idea of of belonging and ambivalence that I was talking about earlier. So you know one one alternate title for the book had I considered unmapping the Muslim world, but then I thought unmapping was too academic or something. Um, so Islam as a foreign country is supposed to be an ironic title. Is the idea is it is it's really a question? Is it is Islam fundamentally um, um yeah, foreign yeah you know and 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 uh and that can you know it's it's really trying to re- reframe the question of can islam even be an american religion in the way that we think about judaism or christianity or even now buddhism as kind of Amer- american religions in a way right um and and not as eastern or foreign religions that, that really belong somewhere else and so that was that was the idea and there's also um you know, a famous line from a novel that I like mm-hmm. that starts with the past as a foreign country. So it's like a play, it's a play on that too. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's really what the, the book is actually about is that really trying to dig at, dig at this question from a lot of different angles, um, you know, to come at this idea of the foreignness of Islam and, and the profound ambivalence that Muslims themselves have about, about whether, about, about America, about the U.S., and the question of whether this place can be a home for them. And that, as I said before, from what I was telling you about my own childhood, is something that, you know, I grew up with that idea my whole life. Uh, I think, like, my father is someone who's profoundly ambivalent about about the U.S. Um, and, 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 and so I, I wanted to capture that idea that that you know for for many american muslims even who have settled here even who've enjoyed success here and many in material success um as well as for many african americans for whom this is the only place they've ever known there is a way in which they they um feel both attracted to but also uh, attracted to the cultural mainstream of, of the u.s but also disaffected by um, by the dominant culture in many ways, and so that's that's really what the book is about. And 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 so I basically take these debates about about Islam or forming Islam, the authority the question of authority in Islam, as a window into these bigger issues around what it means to be Muslim and American, and also what what is what do we mean by American citizenship? Well, I mean, maybe you can you can uh, uh, expand on that a little bit. The, the, no, mm-hmm. the notion, I mean, specifically as it pertains to uh, the the generation of of Muslims that's coming up now, mm-hmm. who are in the second or third generation, and who who are in in a position where they they are fully acclimated into American society. There is no concept of we're going to go home one day because this is home. Right. Uh, and then and then sort of reconciling that with their their muslim identity i mean our, our show is the american muslim experience mm-hmm. what do you, is the american muslim experience today well i don't think there's one that's that's part of it is that so so you know i i think i think you're you're right to point out that yeah you now you have sometimes third and sometimes fourth generation you know I- I- immigrants who for whom the question of going home or the myth of return is 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 you know it's it's completely a fiction it's there's not even it's not even something that they take seriously it's just a trope um but you have to understand that that uh for me that was that was that's not something that's happened now i grew up i people i knew as a kid wow. in dearborn were fourth generation immigrants who were not going back to lebanon or not going back to palestine but you know but, but that, that ambivalence doesn't go away um and that's what i think is important the same thing is true for like the african-american muslim community that you know you have so many you hear you hear things all the time um in that community from people who this is home this is the only place they know um and it's not across the board i mean this is not everybody so for example like imam war muhammad's community is an african-american muslim community that's far less ambivalent about america than than his father's community, the Nation of Islam, is, you know, uh, uh, right? Or, or um, you know, I mean, so there's so, so there's so many 
but you know, my point is not to say that that like ambivalence towards the U.S. is the only way Muslims can be American, <laughs> but I think that it's a really important thread, and it's a way. It's something that you see again and again and again across sectarian lines, across generational lines, across racial lines, across class lines, and that's why for me it was like a, a good. It worked as a good thread because I think that that question doesn't go away even if. Even if there's no place to go back home to, <laughs> there's still this 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 idea that the Muslim world or this other place, um, you know, t- thinking about that, imagining this other place where it's easier to be Muslim, yeah. is something that's all that is always like in the background of debates that Muslims have amongst themselves in the U.S. Uh, so of course, and now, and especially after 9/11, there's just become such a such a there's a lot of energy and momentum around this idea of kind of making Islam local and being American and embracing our Americanness for a certain segment of the community. For some people, like not like I said, Imam the Muhammad's community, that's old news. They've been saying that for you know basically for you know. Uh, two decades before 9/11 happened, uh, but but that that becomes much more of the kind of mainstream American mosque Muslim discourse after 9/11, uh, whether in the African American Muslim community broadly or like for many immigrant communities. Um, but I, I still I still hear it. I still I still hear it. I still think it's there. I think it's there when you look at you know anything from like these viral happy videos to you know i mean whatever it is you could it's it's still there it's, it hasn't gone away you know there's all this there's a lot of anxiety um around what or if you look at like the halal halal meat debates that are happening right now in europe um you know they don't don't really have a correlate here in the us to the extent that they do in, in Europe. But I mean, here, like locally in Connecticut, you know, we have had some of those same issues around halal meat anxieties and, you know, Sharia creep and whatever else it is. So, you know, this stuff, this stuff is, is live. I think um, these, these, these questions and anxieties, both the anxieties of non-Muslims about Islam and the anxieties about among American Muslims themselves about, about um, what it means to be Muslim here in the U S are, are very much pressing and I think at the forefront of a lot of conversations. There's something actually, I mean, you know, the, the, I wanted to actually read something out of your, uh, out of the, like the first chapter. Where oh, you, please do. Sure. I, I, I love it when somebody else reads my book. Right. Right. No, I, I'd love for you, Cause I think it, it, it uh, really eloquently kind of summarizes not only what you've already talked about, but I'd love for you to sort of unpack some of the things that you, or what I hope to, to that the conversation will lead to. Sure. Um, the American Muslim youth share a historical narrative of the fragmentation of Islamic authority with their co-religionists around the world, mm-hmm. but their invocations of crisis also index a very particular, very American set of racial conflicts and religious anxieties. So mm-hmm. I, I think that really captures, on the one hand, what you're saying is that the, you know, the, this generation or the American Muslim, you know, the specifically the American youth that you kind of uh, discuss in your more mm-hmm. ethnographic moments in your book, right. uh, they're, they're struggling with this idea, right? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, that what I, that, 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 that's exactly right. And that's a, that's a great sentence to lift out for me. Um, I think that what I'm trying to show in the book is that, you know, um, American Muslims, and I document this, is that they have been going overseas to study Islam traditionally, um, you know, for, for, for decades. And that, that's always been an important part of the American Muslim religious imagination is the idea of Muslim American seekers who are connected to the Muslim world. Uh, and so we can even think of like Malcolm X as one of those people, Hamza Yusuf, but also even farther back. I mean, it really is from the beginning of the 20th century um, to now that that idea of a kind of intellectual tradition that links Muslims in the U.S. to to other places around the world. Um, that's been a really important part of how Islam is imagined here in the U.S. And so it, it's not a coincidence that you can pick up from Detroit and show up in Cairo, as I did, and enter into a seamlessly enter, enter into a conversation or a debate about religious authority. Because frankly, the global questions and the global fight, um, especially among Sunni Muslims, about who the, what, what is the criteria by which we determine who is an Islamic authority? Mm-hmm. Though, those are actually truly global debates, meaning that they that we share the same terms of debate with Muslims right. all around the world, which is why, and this is not true for every other American religious community. I mean, there's plenty of American Christians who 
go, in fact, there's a rising numbers of American Christian youth who go abroad um, and to Africa, to the to uh, you know other parts of Latin America and other places, and 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 you know are also seekers of a different kind, but they don't have the same kind of uh, religious coherence that you find among what I looked at, which is these American Muslim youth, because they're not all, they don't have the same investments in the same questions. And so it's not the same conversation. They have to kind of learn the local conversation. I mean, that's somewhat true for American Muslims as well. But in a lot of ways, you know, the thing, the fights that Sufis and Salafis are having in Detroit are the same fights Sufis and Salafis are having in Egypt for the most part. I mean, in a sense, you see. And so there's a trend, there, there isn't a real need for that kind of translation. At the same time, Wherever you go, those debates about authority all, always have a local flavor. And, I, my, and my argument is that when you, t- when you look at any religious debate in the U.S. Um, among, among American Muslims, the racial subtext is always there. It's always present because race and racial exclusion, and by that I mean both um, – the 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 complexity of kind of racial tensions within the muslim community but also the process of by which islam itself is racialized that is always present um in in these religious debates so you can't really talk about um in other words so like i was saying i kind of mentioned this with passing but like like the happy videos these sort of viral videos of which are you know going around right now I mean, there, there's a racial conversation around that. It's not simply a fiqh or Islamic legal conversation about dancing or gender mixing or modesty. It's also also a racial, there's a racial subtext there. Um, and so I, I, what I would say is even with halal meat or whatever it is, there's, there's always uh, a way in which debates that seem to be about one thing have a touch point, have a have come back in a way to, you know, these, these larger kind of racial anxieties, uh, American Muslims have. And, and that's, and that's something that's very American. Um, that's not the case. So in other words, that same debate, if you take it and look at it in Indonesia, you know, it's like a debate around, around halal meat or, or around, um, you know, like the permissibility dancing. of dancing. Yeah, yeah, permissibility of dancing, or even modesty, or hijab, right. or whatever it is. It's, right. It doesn't have the same racial valences that it does in the U.S. So that's interesting. So now, when, when, when I mean, even though you don't necessarily discuss them in your book, but for example, when you talk to these students, right, these American students who are studying, who are studying Islam abroad, mm-hmm. um, they obviously have colleagues who are British or parts, of, you know, come from other parts of the Muslim world. Right. Uh, so they're they're looking at the same issues of crisis of authority, but within their own and but the, those are being refracted within their own prisms. Yep. Mm-hmm, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, the, the phenomenon that I'm documenting in the book of American Muslim youth, you know, traveling abroad and studying Islam in, in a kind of classical traditional sense, uh, that's not an American phenomenon. I mean, you have Muslims all over the world that are coming to these places, including from Outside of the West, so I mean, in in, yeah. in Egypt, there's plenty. I mean, an American Muslim may be sitting in a in a in a halakha or a study study circle alongside someone from Malaysia, someone from India, someone from the UK, someone from France. In fact, my own hunch, or I didn't really talk about this in the book, but my own sense is that the 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 the, the um, if you were to look at like the way these global networks, the pattern from the from Europe, they tend to go. There tends to be, it tends to be a colonial connection. In other words, um, if you go to like Syria or you you know you'll you'll tend to find Muslims from other countries that were you know Muslims from France will be in Syria will be in other places that were former French colonies. You know Muslim, Muslims the, the, the British Muslims tend to go to places where the British had work 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 you know had colonized um and so there's some kind of colonial angle uh for for the for the european muslims i think that's that's not there obviously for the u.s um right. whereas i think in the in the u.s case it's much more about the teachers and the networks in the u.s that kind of guide where people end up in in in, in the muslim world um so you know right right now a real hot spot especially given the kinds of controversies that are or kind of uh, political conflicts that are happening in the middle east malaysia is becoming more and more an important kind of magnet for American Muslims. And that has nothing to do with, you know, the U.S.'s, uh, frankly, imperial connections and history with Malaysia. It has everything to do with the fact of a kind of intellectual genealogy of who's there and what kind of activities are and what's, what's happening on the intellectual scene in Malaysia, uh, particularly for feminist Muslims and progressive Muslims. Right. So now going back to what you just, you, you mentioned about the teachers and the kind of, um, 
uh, pedagogical, like sort of, you know, projects or encounters that these mm-hmm. American youth or these American seekers are having in, in the Middle East or in the traditional Muslim world, right? Mm-hmm. And you can mm-hmm. find them along the line of lines of like formalist, pragmatist, reformist, correct? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I came up with my own rubric of terms. <laughs> yeah. well, I know, and, I uh, and, I, and, and I think you, I mean, you have to in a, I mean, kind of doing this kind of a, doing it academically the way you approach these things. Uh, but how would you sort of unpack those, those uh, rubrics into, mm-hmm. like, how, you know, just translating them in, in a way that the average sort of Muslim community member would understand it? Yeah, you know, it's, so it's interesting. I mean, I guess the reason I came up with the rubric is because I was frustrated by what I would say were the kind of binary divisions that I found both in the way non-Muslims talk about Islamic education and its reform and Muslims themselves. So the, so that, that part of the book uh, looks looks at, I mean, basically the way it's usually framed by non-Muslims is that there are either liberal Muslims or conservative Muslims on the question of, of Islamic schooling. And, um, you know, the liberal Muslims are open to reform and the conservative Muslims are not. Well, that's completely not true. I mean, that's just, it's just I, I the very... Chapters, sorry, in the later chapters, I love how when one of the things, the expressions you use is sort of in the post-9-11 context, the, the quote-unquote good good Muslim citizen, right? Right. So, yeah, right. So I think that kind of goes to what you were saying in terms of... Yeah, it, it does. So, I mean, there's, you know, it's sort of like liberal Muslim, right. whatever that means, is always being set up as the person who's open to reform and change. And what, I'm, what I would argue is that that's actually not the case. I mean, in other words, the idea that Islamic education requires reform is something that almost is a universally agreed upon. It's just the degree and the nature of the reform yeah, that right. Muslims are, are fighting about. So this idea of like it's reformist, like liberal reformists versus like, you know, stodgy uh, conservatives who won't, who won't budge. That's not the case. Um, and then, and then among Muslims, the problem that you have, and this is something that, you know, um, is something that you see again and again in the rhetoric is this idea that there's some Muslims who are open to secular or are secularized and some who are not. And so, you know, what, what I saw was that even among um, the most uh, quote unquote traditional um, Muslims, they have already accepted so many premises from secular education. In other words, everyone's already secular in a sense, when you talk about uh, educational reform in Islam, because they're, they're, even their, de- their defense of themselves, uh, their notion of expertise is not, it's derived from a very modern and very secular understanding of what intellectual expertise is. So th- that's one thing. So I wanted to say, I'm not going to talk about conservative and Muslim, conservative and liberal Muslims. I'm not going to talk about secular versus religious Muslims because all of the, both, both of those ways of framing it, like you will miss, you'll miss the whole point. That's and instead, right. instead I wanted to think about, you know, the, the actual, um, the actual philosophical, um, the actual, phil- the actual educational philosophies that are being de- being debated, and I think that's a much more productive way of looking at it because you're actually taking the ideas seriously, wow. as opposed to sort of like political labels. And if you do that, so that you know what I came up with in terms of formalists, where that's a term that I came up with just just to d- describe um, individuals who are committed to preserving both the educational forms as well as the content. And so for them, it's the way, the way you learn it is just as important as what you're learning. And then, uh, and, the, and these, and these are on a spectrum, by the way, it's not like these are like hard and fast categories. Uh, and then, and then I talk about pragmatists who are, um, you know, they, they may, may or may not have a problem with pedagogical forms in other words the way you the way things have been done may be good may be bad may be neutral um but they they're they're really mostly invested in in, in the content and and so they're they're open to they're they're more open um to change and 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 new forms than formalists who are committed like right to the way things have been done in a way that pragmatists may or may not be mm. and then um finally reformists for them there's actually a problem with the, there's actually a problem with the way things have been done. So in other words, the way Islamic education has been transmitted over time, there's something wrong. And, um, and so whether the, that thing that, that those problems may be with the way it's been done, or there was a form, those edu- educational design, right. it could also be with the content. And so that's actually the position of both feminist Muslims who think that, you know, who have the position that, you know, there's misogynistic, 
uh, elements of the content in Islamic context in the curriculum, as well as Salafis who say, oh, there's theological, there's theologically problematic content that's become part of um, part of Islamic you know, curriculum or like the ways in the certain habits of teacher student relationships are bordering on, you know, um, being theologically problematic. In other words, it's almost like teacher worship or whatever you want to call it, you know? So, 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 so this, so in other words, by having this kind of a spectrum kind of view of it, you end up seeing that there's actually the, the, the philosophies of feminists and Salafis are actually quite similar. They have different problems, but like the way that they, the, 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 the macro way they, env- they envision Islamic education needing to change is the same, which is that you need to actually clean it out, uh, you know, remove the impurities that are, that are un-Islamic. Pragmatists, pragmatists may, may not have that position. They may think there's nothing wrong with the way things have been done, but what's the best way to do things now? Wow. And for the for the formalists, no. In fact, the way things have been done is actually very important and must be preserved in a way, uh, because the the value, the Islamic value, is not only in the content but actually in the way you learn it. So, so Zarina, I mean, like, I, I, I'd love to. So, I, what, I, what I want to tell the, the 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 listener is that you know, in, in your book, Zarina, like, you don't like find you 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 kind of lay out these rubrics or what have you, but mm-hmm. you also don't shy away from actually looking at, you know, some notable figures vis-a-vis these various uh, rubrics. So, for example, you talk about Sheikh Nuhamim Keller, you talk about mm-hmm. Ali Goma, you talk about Hamza Yusuf, uh, right. you know, the Qubaysiyat, Yasser Qadi. And, and I, I want to sort of just, I'm just throwing that out there just to sort of tease the reader. I mean, I'm sorry, the listener. Yeah, yeah at the listener, I, I really would encourage everyone listening to the podcast to, 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 you know, check out the book because I think yeah. that, um, and so I, I don't, you don't necessarily need to go any, in, in, into any detail in terms of some of the names that I've mentioned, mm-hmm. but I did want to throw that out there that, that you talk yeah. about these figures and the right. role you play. Now, what I wanted to ask you though, is, uh, in, you know, kind of a more of a broader question. Why the, why them in particular and why not others? Uh, you know, that, that's a great question. I mean, part of it was just um, who I happened to encounter where I was. I mean, if I had gone to Yemen instead of uh, Syria, maybe I, w- I obviously probably would not have talked about the Qubaysiyat. You know, it was sort of um, mm-hmm. who I was actually meeting on the ground that I that, that sort of determined. If I had not gone to Jordan, I probably would not have talked about Sheikh Keller uh, right. in the way that I do. You know, so if I had gone to Morocco instead, for example, and I did consider many other sites. I also initially the project was going to be also partly in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that it, things, things just shifted based on like where I was and who I was meeting. Although I think the big ideas translate to those other things. So for example, you know, if we think about like formalist institutions in the U S Zaytuna Institute comes to mind. Zaytuna College is a little bit more complicated. I think it's closer to, I mean, sort of like a, there's sort of a tug of war happening in, within Zaytuna, whether it's going to be a formalist institution or whether it's going to be more pragmatist. But um, certainly the original Zaytuna Institute was very formalist. Uh, Darul Alum, you know, the Deobandi Institutes that we have in the in the U.S. are very formalist. Uh, pragmatist sort of Alam, Sherman Jackson and Imam Manir Free, then uh, Sheikh Ali Suleiman's organization, the American Learning Institute for Muslims, mm-hmm. is a kind of classic pragmatist example uh, as is no we foundation which used to uh, exist in chicago wow. um you know, and then, and then for the reformists, you can think of like the Progressive Muslim Union, but also Al Maghreb or other kinds of institutions that are, you know, um, that have a kind of reformist theology or reformist practice as part of their vision. Uh, and so, you know, for me, you have to put these abstract c- c- categories. You have to name names, and you have to give, kind of give concrete examples. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. And um, one of the things that's really interesting for me is that um, what I found, you know, because at the end of the day, although I interviewed you know, so, so many people, um, just to make the book more readable, I end up focusing on case studies of about, uh, I guess a dozen, uh, American Muslim young people who you can also put on the spectrum. And what I find is when I ask people, you know, who, who did you relate to in the book? Um, often their own sort of orientation on this spectrum reflects who they relate to. So I was talking to a, a young man and he said, oh, you know, I really relate to this guy, Richard, in the book, who's just like, you know, I'm not trying to be a sheikh. I'm just trying to get through the day and just like be, you know, live, learn my religion. And, you know, that this is someone who, who very much thinks the same way he does. And so I think, um, you know, I, to, to, well, I guess, I guess what I would say is that for me as an author, it's been really nice to see that the response to the book has kind of, um, resonated with 
ordinary people for whom these kinds of abstract categories might not have a real meaning, but it, but I, I think that it's like hitting something real. Oh, could you just right. real quick, I mean, we're okay. gonna, but, um, I'm curious, just as a reader, I've been curious. So were, were the names protected or were the names yeah. changed? Like the innocent? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And, and and also like any other identifying details. I mean, you know, anonymity oh, okay. anonymity was important because not not only for like the preference of the of the individuals I interviewed, but also because, you know, I mean these are this Islamic um this pursuit of Islamic studies like off the radar of the government is something yeah. that's obviously very problematic in places like Egypt and Syria and elsewhere and Jordan for that matter. Right. And um and and so it's not simply just to protect the anonymity of the individuals I interviewed, but also, you know, their fellow students, their peers, their teachers and uh, uh, although I do use the names of the actual names of any, you know, intellectuals that I don't, I didn't think it was worth trying to conceal. Like, so I talk about Sheikh Newkeller or Ali Goma or, you know, whoever, mm-hmm. people who are sort of publicly um, recognized as representing various movements. But uh, yeah. And, and in fact, that's been part of the frustration is I have actually had to go back and kind of remind the interviewees that like even if you don't mind if people know that you are the person in this chapter you know when you reveal yourself then you're also kind of putting at risk all kinds of other people who were there when you were there you're just giving you know in other words so we that it's it's not simply for it's for the greater good that it's kept anonymous right right you know like so I think that what I, you know, one of the things I would have loved to have seen, um, or, or, or you explore, and, and you said, and you kind of alluded to this, where you said that originally you were, you know, you, you were thinking that your research would take you to the subcontinent, but I think that's an, that's a very sort of interesting kind of growing, you know, you know movement here in America in terms of these Darul Loom type institutions that are popping up. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 I, what do you think that? Um, how, how does that tie into the research that you see happening in the Middle East? You know that. When yeah. We were, well, uh, so I did, I did, I did do some pilot research in Pakistan, and in fact, one of the people that's a big part of the book is a um, someone named Jawad, who did actually study study in Lahore um, before he came to Jordan, and and that's not unusual to have someone who studied in the subcontinent or in other parts of the Middle East before they end up in another part of the Middle East, uh, because these are really about global networks and people moving, you know, around, and so um, that that's I, what what I my own impression when I went to um, Pakistan and did did initial field work there. I also did a little bit in, in Lebanon um, and in and in the Emirates. Um, was that the questions were the same? You know that the the, the the kinds of pursuits were similar. Uh, there's a little bit of a different history. Um, in some ways, Pakistan is closer to Egypt than it is to Jordan or Syria, simply because there is a long-standing. Um, uh, uh, you know, tradition of American Muslims going there to study, which they used to be primarily African Americans from Tablighi Jamaat, but also uh, other movements, other South Asian movements that have brought American Muslims to those places to study. So, you know, you, I encountered African American Muslims who have kind of settled settled in, in Lahore or other places uh, because they studied in, in Pakistan and decided not to go back to the U.S. In the same way that I found African American communities of expats uh, living in Cairo uh, or in, uh, throughout North Africa, you find that phenomenon. So there, you know, I think there's an. Um, I think, of course, there would be things that are different about the subcontinent versus the Arab world, but I, I, I tend to be more struck. I'm, I'm more, I personally am more struck by the similarities uh, than the differences. Um, because I, I, and the same thing for Malaysia. I mean, of course, Malaysia is a very, very different context than, than Egypt in many ways, but in other ways, it's very similar. And Turkey, you know, some one of the characters in the book um, had starts off in Egypt and goes to Turkey for a while and then comes back to Egypt. So. This is really not an, a story about the the U.S. and the Arab world. It really is a story about the U.S. and the Muslim world. It just happened that, and this is purely for funding reasons, um, <laughs> that I, I wasn't able to get you know funding for a non-Arab site because you know that that's that's actually uh, one of the co- sort of Cold War biases of area studies in the university, exactly. which is that yeah. And, right. and I'm having I'm hitting up against the same thing right now in my next book, but but you know awesome. they they really think of the Arab world as a con, as a contained place, and really when you want to talk about transnational movements in Islam, you can't think you can't div- divorce the Arab world from subcontinent, from other parts of the Middle East, from Africa, etc. And obviously from the West, which is what my whole argument is. 
Right. And, you know, and I think that, but in addition to just the fact of, of how, say, Western academia looks at it or how America, you know, how uh, America looks at, at the Middle East, I think that it's also telling that within the Muslim community, uh, you know, a lot of the discourse that I find, ha- you know, you, you, you really romanticize the Middle East, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. and, and so what, that's what I thought would have been even, if we did have, you know, uh, a real analysis of what's happening in the subcontinent mm-hmm. um, or, or Islam in the periphery or the periphery of the Muslim world, that would have been really interesting as well. Because I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm working on a, an article right now that will have some parts from the Pakistani um, right. uh, field work. Uh, but you know what? There, there's there's also a way in which Pakistan is also romanticized. In other words, the Muslim world writ large is romanticized True. as, a, as True. a place where Islam is purer, more accessible, more uh, you know, untainted or, or whatever it is. I, I, of course, the, there's like an Arab primacy that's always there. That like Arabs are somehow because of the, because Arabic is the language of the Quran. Somehow, Arab culture is always or often uh, constructed as the culture. Right? Even when we look at like say whether it's the, along Salafi lines or Sufi lines or whatever other sort of you know demarcations we look at, it, it's mm-hmm. it's it's still Sufism within an Arab guise. I mean, within an era, uh, 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 not guys, but, you know, like... Uh, yeah, 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 no, I understand. Well, but, but see, I, I guess the, the reason I would problematize that is that, like, so, like, I, I mean, depending on whether you count Mauritania as an Arab country or an African country, I mean, you know, the Hamza Yusuf effect, of course, is really about Mauritania, which is a West African more, I think, or at least in the way it's imagined by most American Muslims, although yeah. you, could, you could count... Mauritania as an Arab country in a way, but but it's a, it's an African country. I mean, I think so. I I do think, and I think an earlier points, you know, for Malcolm X, it was it was Indonesia that was most inspiring, and later it, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, uh, because of the Bandung Conference. And so, I, I I do think that it isn't that the Arab, uh, for, for, in, in my own view of it, I don't think that Arab authenticity is the default position. I think it it, it that that that. Um, you know that kind of authentic core can move and shift, and um, and that's what I'm saying is that for you know right now Malaysia is becoming a much more important kind of location for like feminists and progressive Muslims because there's so much intellectual work that's happening in Malaysia uh, that's not happening in in the Arab in in in, in, in Arab sites, and so they're they're much more excited to go to Malaysia for that reason, and I think that's what you sometimes lose when you just look at it purely in terms of, you know, air, like Muslim core and periphery as if everything emanates out from the middle East, that's actually not the case. I mean, uh, so when you start looking at something, even like Elijah Muhammad, I mean, Elijah Muhammad, you know, was he, he, the Afro, the, you know, the, 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 the Asiatic black man or the Afro Asia kind of vision that he had, you know, Indonesia and Pakistan and were very much a part of that. Um, and you know he he wasn't only visiting Arab countries. He was also he also visited Pakistan. He also visited other places um, outside of the Middle East. And of course, Africa was a, a huge part of the ways in which you know these early black black Muslim communities, uh, when they thought about the Muslim world, they often thought about Africa first. You know what I mean? And that's something that we don't want to forget. Uh, and and I think Hamza Yusuf, of course, has made West Africa. You know, he, he presents Mauritania as a kind of utopia. I mean, most American Muslims have heard of Amer- have heard of Mauritania because of Hamza Yusuf. They probably could not find it on a map. They don't know anything about Mauritania mm-hmm. other than this is this like pure place where you can get, you know, uh, you can study Islam um, the way Sheikh Hamza Yusuf did. And and so I, I, I think that, that, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is I think there's like a more complicated map of the Muslim world um, than you might expect when you actually look at it. I, I think it'd be remiss not to mention that, you know, uh, even though our conversation hadn't, hasn't sort of expanded on it in great detail, but in your book, I mean, the, the, you know, beyond the starting point of your own experiences in your home growing up, you know, one of the earlier, the, you know, the earliest, I would say a third of your book or what have you, uh, discusses these proto, proto-Islamic movements in America, whether it's the Nation of Islam, the uh, MTSA, so, you know, and, and the Ahmadiyya movement. So you talk about this stuff. Again, I just want to say that for the, for the benefit of the, of, the, of the listener. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't call them proto-Muslim. I would say they're black religion Muslims. But, but, uh, but yeah, but, 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 um, 
what I so what I'm interested in there, and and they're not all black. So in other words, not all black religion Muslims are black. Uh, so for example, one of the black religion Muslim movements that I look at is the Ahmadiyya from India. Um, and so uh, to me, it's actually very important that we break the sectarian division of the story of Islam in America, which is basically post 65 Sunni dominance, uh, and that we have to see the connections between what we're, what's going on today is very connected to what happened to the Nation of Islam and what happened to the Ahmadiyya and what happened to the Moorish Science Temple. And a lot of their questions, as different as the theology may be or the religious practices may be between Sunnis and some of these earlier groups, the the fact that the questions are the same around um, and, and around their attachments to the Muslim world are the same. That's a very important thing that I wanted to sort of play up in the book uh, to sort of see that, you know, the, 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 the kind of ambivalence that we started talking about at the very beginning towards the U.S. and this whole attachment to the Muslim world or the, the kind of overinvestment almost in Muslim places that are someplace else and the very close attention to race is something that, that has always been there. Even it's, before, not it's, not, it's not a post-65 phenomenon at all. That's and, right. and, and that's important to understand. And so, you know, I think for some people, they start reading the historical chapters in the book and they think, why do I care about the Moorish Science Temple? What does that have to do with me? Uh, but it has a lot to do with you. And so I try to make some parallels between like, you know, Salafis in Thobes in the 90s are very, very much like moors in in thobes in the 1930s you know there's a there's a reason why clothes and other certain forms of the east become really important at certain points um and not others you know and 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 so that that like looking at that kind of the kind of cultural practices of various muslim communities across these sectarian lines i think is really important i'm very invested in that in telling that story of islam in america without being um in other words you know, when you start talking about like the detailed religious debates, you have to sometimes, I mean, I do like for the, for the, the religious authority, for the debates about religious authority, I do focus on Sunnis because religious authority is very different for Shia Muslims and the debates about it are very different. And so you can't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about them together because they are so different. Um, but when you're talking about like the big picture stuff, like why are we here? Can Islam be an American religion? What's our relationship to the Muslim world? What do we owe the, the global ummah? Um, those are questions that Muslims have regardless of whether they're, they're Moors, Ahmadis, Nation of Islam, Sunni, Shia, or whatever. Did you debate or, or, or think about cons- or, or wanted to include maybe Alexander Webb in that whole when you're talking about that chapter? Yeah, I, I, I just period wise, I stuck, stuck to the 20th century, so I did not talk about I did not talk about Muhammad Alexander Webb, but um, you know he's certainly connected to the Ahmadiyya and to South Asian Islam, and 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 he's a very important figure, and I think that he, you know, it, it's 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 interesting because. I was really interested. I guess the way I, I framed the study was thinking about communities, and because Webb was sort of a sole like uh, kind of individual, you know, he never really had a, got a community behind him. That's sort of one of the reasons why I left him out. Although, obviously, the same questions occupied him that would occupy other you know generations of Muslims to, to, to this day, frankly. Um, I'd, I'd like to go back to a phrase you used, which I think is really interesting, because as we talk about uh, the story of Islam in America, obviously, Hamza Yusuf is such a, a a big presence in that story, I think. And, uh, and you use the phrase, the Hamza Yusuf effect, which I think is just fascinating. How would you characterize the Hamza Yusuf effect? So what I, what I, what I call the Hamza Yusuf effect is really the popularization of, of this idea that um, one must travel to the Muslim world and study traditionally in order to bring back the tradition uh, to the U.S. and that that's going to actually elevate and um, transform Muslim debates within mo- American mosques. Before um, the 90s, when, she, when Sheikh Hamza Yusuf returns to the U.S. and becomes a really prominent public figure, you know, the 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 the, the focus in American mosques was not on the deep history of Islam. Nobody was talking about pre-modern intellectuals like al-ghazali or whoever very often they were talking about the muslim world but they're talking about the contemporary middle east and they were talking about uh or or contemporary south asia or contemporary whatever homeland fill in the blank homeland you know they they were very focused on the modern period and what sheikh hamza yusuf did whether you loved him or hated him 
is that he changed the conversation for for really for American Muslims for for American Muslims who were mosque like what we call mosque Muslims in other words for for Muslims who were part of this kind of national conversation about Islam uh, and who were relatively practicing Muslims he changed that conversation for everybody and so suddenly even his most ardent Salafi critics had to sort of change the way they critiqued him because he changed the terms of the debate uh, he, by, by bringing in the deep history and making that long story of Islam's glory days, uh, the glorious period of Islamic, the golden age of Islam, making that the primary focus as opposed to something kind of in the distant background, which, you know, um, and so like one of the things that I do in, in the in the historical chapter is to really sh- compare different, I mean, what, I'm, what the book partly is doing is it's, it's, it's actually an intellectual history of, of Islam in America. Yeah. And so, um, I, 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 you know, for me, I'm, I'm trying to think about, it's not, it's not the, it's not the Sheikh Hamza Yusuf story. It's not about his biography. It's really about his intellectual impact. Uh, and, and before him, it was, um, you know, there was other people, uh, Ismail Faruqi is someone, another intellectual that I look at. You know, Warthin Muhammad is another person that I want to think about as an intellectual. Uh, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X. I mean, these are all religious leaders, but they're also intellectuals who are, who are changing um, the discourse of American Muslims in different moments. And so that's, that's what I want to try to capture. Yeah, no, and certainly I, I think, uh, yeah, we don't want to give the illusion that this is sort of a, a, a book on Hamza Yusuf by any means or Zaytuna or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, someone who you, do, who you also mentioned, uh, a, a friend of mine, someone I went to college with, uh, you know, Yasser Fadi, you know, mm-hmm. so okay. uh-huh. talk about him within the context of al Maghrib, um, and so that's yeah. We want to make that very clear. Yeah, um, I mean, I I I, I think uh, the al Maghrib and and the sort of um, whatever you want to call it, Salafi 2.0 or whatever that kind of like post 90s uh-huh. Salafi movement that is revived through. Uh, you know, Qadi, Sharif, all these other people that are part of, you know, that, that movement is, is a very important intellectual movement. I mean, they've made, they've made an intellectual, um, contribution. Uh, and it's a, and, and they're, and they're also reacting to Hamza Yusuf, uh, in many ways and, and, oh, yeah. and Zaytuna, right? And so I want to sort of put those different ideas in conversation. Right, right, exactly. And, and again, uh, yeah, I think that's that's the other thing about your book, which again the the listeners should know is that you know you're not making necessary you know you're not making any value judgments about these people, but but really just looking at the again the role they play and their and their and their approach to educational you know structures and so on plays vis-a-vis the you know the whole issue of authority in in, in, in America. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, look, I, you know, I'm talking about a lot of. American Muslim intellectuals and religious leaders who are very dear to the hearts of many people. And I'm talking about them in a critical way. And I critique some of their ideas. And for some people, this is the first time they've ever heard their sheikh or their teacher be criticized in any way, shape or form. And they're very sensitive about it. And so I say very clearly up front in the book that, I, you know, I don't have any doubt that any of these individuals are there about their sincerity. I think all of these individuals are very sincere people they're very intelligent people um and and it's because out of my respect for them that i want to take their ideas seriously as intellectual ideas uh and and i also don't give i mean i didn't i do talk about myself and my own story throughout the book Mm -hmm. but um and i have a perspective on all of these debates that i'm talking about whether it's about gender issues whether it's about theology whether it's about sufism in america what you know i have my own personal opinion i did not put that in the book because frankly i don't think what i where I fall on these debates really matters. It's really about what the debate looks like. And then you have to kind of, you know, sort of muddle through it and sort of figure out where you come out at the end of it. And I, and I did that for myself. Um, but I didn't want that to be the story of the book because, you know, we, we have this whole phenomenon of really, uh, frankly, privileged, uh, mostly South Asian, but sometimes Arab women who are writing book after book about the reform of Islam and how it should be reformed and how they figured out the perfect solution. And uh, that would have been very easy for me to do, and I probably would have sold a lot more books had I done that, but I really did not want to do that. I really wanted to say, you know what, it doesn't actually matter what my individual opinion is on any of these religious questions, because I'm not a religious authority to anybody, frankly, other, other than maybe my kids, if even that. You know, um, uh, you, you, no one really cares what Zarina thinks about, you know, this fifth question or this theological question, um, or whether I'm a Sufi or a Salafi or not, or what. Uh, what I wanted to do was to really present 
the range of ideas that are out there that are being fought over and to sort of give you a sense that, you know what, there's a lot of energy, intellectual energy be, being put into this into these debates. It's, it's serious. And uh, as American Muslims, we are dealing with very serious arguments. Uh, it's not, it's, you know, there, there, there's a, there's a, in, in some ways, you know, as, as, as elements of the book that are pessimistic, but I think that for me, and this is not even just about the book, but just generally, I, I actually have a lot of hope for the American Muslim religious discourse, because I actually think there's like a lot of thought, energy, and sincerity that is just apparent when you look at religious discourse in American mosques. I think that, you know, that I, I think it's quite uh, moving um, that people are so invested and they care and they're really trying. And at the end of the day, if you're sincere, I mean, I, you just, I, I, I just believe in that. So, so you know, while I, I take issue with certain things that um, various intellectuals, Muslim intellectuals have said, whether it's Ismail Faruqi, whether it's Wardin Muhammad, whether it's uh, Hamza Youssef, whether it's New Keller, Yasser Qadi, Amina Wadud, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I'm trying to get, look at a range of people who I take, I take their ideas very seriously. I, I may critique them, but that doesn't mean that I don't think that they're um, trying and that they're sincere. And that, and then in fact, uh, whether or not they're they're able to compel the Muslim masses is the ultimate test, right? That's really what it comes down to: is that do people think they're right or not, and follow them? The whole marketplace of ideas, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I will say, I mean, even though you know, again, you don't it, 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 by no means is the book autobiographical or anything to you, and you've kind of you you leave your voice uh, uh, or your opinions, like you said, or what Serena Grewal has to say on X X or Y issue out of it. I think I will say again for the listener that. Anyone who grew up in the Muslim community in the 90s uh, really came into their own in the 90s in terms of their own Muslim, their own, their own voice within American Muslim discourse, uh, I think can find so much in the book. Um, I, you know, I will really say that as a, as a oh, way. Of thank you. Yeah, no, no, I, I hope so. I hope so. That means I'm doing um, that means I'm doing good anthropology. Well, that, think, yeah. If you recognize yourself in it, that's the whole idea. That's right. And I think people contemporaneous to you and me. Uh, Zucky, even even though Zucky is a little a little youngling uh, yeah. compared to me, but um, anyway, so I, th I think we'll we'll really find something to yeah. to really relate to and and, and have lived uh, in that period. Um, so I know we're we're really close to the close to the end now, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I think uh, that actually puts us in a good place to start wrapping things up. I mean, I I think what what we really emphasized is how uh, this text really serves as kind of. A, 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 a chronicle of uh, Islam's story in America without getting into the, the uh, as you say, uh, um, value judgments. Right. And I, and I think that's important. I mean, I think, I think uh, in, in a lot of ways, that's what this show is about. So that's why we're, we're very grateful to have been able to have you on and really talk, talk to us about that. Great. No, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Well, just, just as, as we start wrapping things up now, again, for, for our listeners, the name of the book is Islam is a Foreign Country, American Muslims and the Global Crisis of Authority. And it's available uh, on Amazon and various other uh, book selling venues, I'm assuming. And, and, and unlike, I will say, you know, I mean, as far as academic publishing goes, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I've seen books range in the hundreds of dollars. Uh, you know, this one you can pick up for, uh, you know, uh, you know, 20 bucks or so on Amazon. So yeah, well, and the Kindle version, I think is only $10 or the ebook. You go, version. You so, you know, it's, 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 it's affordable. And so, I fought, I fought for that with my press. I fought to keep the price low for a reason. Cause I do want the community to read it. Right. I will say it's affordable. The ideas, even though they are so they they're, 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 they're pretty, you know, hefty stuff, but you unpackage it in a way that is so readable, I think, for even the non-academic. Uh, and so really encourage the uh, like the listeners to check it out. Um, again, like Zaki was saying. Uh, so Zarina, uh, where can people find you online? I mean, obviously you're a faculty member at Yale. Yeah, I have, a t I have a Twitter account. I have a you know small following on Twitter. I'm I'm uh, people can contact me at my Yale address if you know they, I, I'm getting emails all the time about the book and questions and and yeah I, I look forward to it. I mean the and the and, you know I've been doing a little mini book tour which has been interrupted by uh, my pregnancy. Um, so you know these th these things happen. But I will be hopefully coming to a town and or city near you with you know on the book tour and um, I I hope people check it out. Right. And I will say, you know, again, we're, we're recording on Mother's Day, so I would be, again, remiss not to say Happy Mother's Day. To oh, thank you. Yes. Of what? Three or two people? Uh, yeah, I have two that are 
outside of my body. And I've <laughs> one, one that's been kicking me in the lungs this whole time. So, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, again, uh, thank you so much for speaking with us, and um, we'll we'll look forward to hopefully having you back on at some point to uh, talk about your further explorations of this subject. Great. Thanks so much. All right. So as we wrap things up, I want to remind everybody, please do look for us on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Uh, leave us a review. Leave us a star rating. Every little bit helps. All of your feedback helps. Uh, again, as I mentioned at the outset, Send us an email at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. We will absolutely read whatever uh, appropriate feedback that you send us. So be aware of that, and we'll certainly try to address everything. Uh, Pervez, where can people find you online? Uh, well, certainly, you know, please go to our Facebook page, uh, you know, uh, Diffuse Congruence, uh, the American Muslim Experience. Um, I'm not very active on Twitter, but I do have a Twitter handle, uh, the new Madhab. You, you want to spell that for us? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so it's... T H E N E W M A D H H A B. It's a mouthful. There will be a quiz on that next time, so beware. And of course, you can find me at Zaki's Corner, that's Z A K I S Corner, and also at the Huffington Post, where my film reviews go up uh, every week or close to it. You can also find me on Twitter at Zaki's Corner, Z A K I S Corner. Again, we look forward to hearing from you, and hopefully, you will look forward to hearing from us next month. Thanks for listening.